Saturate us this morning. Saturate us this morning. Saturate us this morning. Yes, you.
been interceded for your city this morning that the glory of God would enter, that the glory of God would saturate this city, that the glory of God would saturate this church, that the glory of God would saturate every individual in this place from the front to the back. God, let your glory saturate this morning. We want to be in the overflow this morning. We want to be in the overflow of the Holy Spirit. God, we are for you. Seek your face. We seek your face this morning. Oh, come on, let us be in one mind and one accord this morning. Oh, God, we pray that we're all in one mind and one accord. That we're in unity this morning. Come on. Sing it. We wait. We wait for you. We wait for you. Come on, invite him in.
place. Our King is alive in this place. Come on, we're going to end out and sing in the name of Jesus. I know we opened up with this song, but something about the name of Jesus.
tell you, you're in the right place this morning. I need to tell somebody this. God wants you to know this. He wants to tell you that before God shaped you in your mother's womb, he knew all about you. And before you saw the light of day, he had holy plans for you. Perhaps a prophet to the nations. That's what he had in mind for you. Can I tell you, he, he had a plan for today, for every single one of us being here today, for the plans that are, that are going to go on today, for your day tomorrow, for your week next week. He has a plan for it all. Every single thing you're going through, he has a plan for it. A purpose for your existence. You're alive for more than just existing. And today, we have an opportunity to find out what that is. Oh, God, we, we lift up this service to you, God, in everything that you're going to do today. God, we pray, God, that you would touch hearts. God, transform our minds. Renew us, God. Give us clean slates. And God, allow us to know your glory. And God, as you do so, God, we pray, God, that we would love you all the days of our life. I thank you for what you're going to do here today. For the lives that are going to be saved, set free, and transformed. God, we give you glory and honor for the privilege of worshiping you today in this house. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we all shout, amen and amen. Please turn around and greet somebody. Let them know how beautiful it is to see them. church come on is anybody excited to be alive be here be awake see I can agree with what Matt said Matt said that his heart was racing and so was mine and I didn't know why but it reminds me of of when you first meet a loved one right someone that you want to start courting dating and talking to right your heart races you got that butterflies inside your stomach but I think that this is a season for this church this going back to their first love, come on, which is Christ, amen? If this is your first time here, we welcome you, welcome. Welcome, if this is your second time here, welcome, third time here, welcome. If you do not have a home church, I pray that you would consider this to be your home church, amen? So I'm up here for tithes and announcements, tithes, whoa, announcements, tithes and offering, amen? Come on church, someone say come on back. Come on, come on back tomorrow. We have a women's discipleship. All the ladies in the house come out. I hear, I hear, I hear, and it's a good source that it's going to be a Holy Ghost party because the Holy Ghost is going to be here. Amen? Come on, you can sign up with Sister Irene for refreshments everywhere. Uh, invite people, matter of fact. Amen? Someone say, come on back. Come on back to Wednesday night service. Come on. Hey, Wednesday night service just isn't a midweek refresher. That's not it. That's another encounter with our Heavenly Father. Amen. Prayer at 6 p.m. Service starts at 7 p.m. I challenge you. I challenge you. I challenge you to invite somebody. Amen. All week this week. Come on. We ain't just a Sunday to Sunday church. We're doing some all week long. In fact, Tuesday. Someone say Tuesday. We actually have a marriage class that is taking place. If you signed up, please be faithful to that. Amen? That's starting 6.30 p.m. here at the church. Sharp. Amen? 
Someone say 630 sharp. That's when it's going to start. Amen. Last thing, our commitments. Anybody make commitments? Matter of fact, when you have a job, you make a commitment to wake up in the morning and go to work, right? Come on. And the reason why I bring up commitments is because I believe that a lot of us made a heart for the house commitment. Come on. Do not neglect your heart for the house. The Bible says let your yes be yes and your no's be no's. So that yes you made, let it be yes. Amen? Woo, come on. It gets quiet when we start getting into finances, right? Hello, somebody. Come on, now it's time for tithes and offering. Anybody, you guys want to take up an offering? Come on, th two people want to take up an offering. Praise God. Let me get the ushers and greeters up here, please. If you want to text to give, the number is 714-710-1981. There it is up there. Praise God. That's an easy way to give. If you would like an envelope, you can raise your hand and greeters will give you an envelope. Amen. I don't know what it is, but I don't know if it was the, it's the coffee or what it is that got me super excited right now. It's not the coffee. I'm not going to give coffee no credit. It's the Holy Ghost. Amen. I believe, I know that I know that I know that I know God's going to do something right now, today, in Jesus' name. Proverbs Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 9 through 10 says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first, fruit, first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflow, overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Some will say first fruits. See, we all know that this scripture is talking about giving. Some will say giving. But not just giving, but giving to God. See? It's saying with your first fruits, like you guys said. See, we got some scholars here. Someone said first fruits. Come on now. See, it's talking about your first fruit. And not only this scripture is just not another scripture that we just go by. Just, it's just, that's just not what we do. Amen? This scripture is a promise of God. Come on. It's a promise. And it reminds me of. It reminds me of. My children. It reminds me of my kids. And I know it's going to remind you of your kids as soon as I say this. You ever tell your kid, look, if you be good, if you be good, we'll go to McDonald's after. I got you. <laughs> if you be good, I'm going to get you some candy. Matter of fact, we all do this one. Look, we're going to the store right now. We're going to Walmart, and there's a lot of demons in there already, all right? So if you're good, I'll get you some candy, right? If you're good. Anybody say that to your kids? Not the demon part, but just the fact that you'll give them some if they be good. Amen? So it reminds me of that, a reward that we tell our kids, like, look, I'm going to give you this if you do this. Amen? Can anybody confess to that? But see, here in this scripture, the reward is the overflow. The, someone say Overflow. But there has to be faithfulness first. Because it says right here, your first fruit. See, many times we like to think that if I just give here and there, I will get the overflow. That's not what it says, right? There has to be consistency in your first fruit for the overflow to take place. Come on, somebody. If you have an issue with consistency, let's get rid of that today. Because your consistency is going to get you to your overflow. Come on, I don't think anybody's excited about this. They're like, consistency in my first fruit? What are you talking about, Brother Joe? I challenge you to be consistent for a year of your first fruit and see what God's going to do to you. Me and my wife, we never went without. I praise God every day. Matter of fact, that's one of the biggest issues in marriage is finances. That's not my issue. Sometimes my wife yell at me because I spend too much. We all know that, right? Brother Joe spend too much. But I'm like, God's going to provide. She goes, but he's not telling you to be foolish. And I was like, he's faithful even when I'm not. What are you talking about, foolish? But she's like, no, we got to give our first fruit. Amen? Anybody ready to give their first fruit? Anybody ready to be consistent today in the house of God and forevermore? Amen? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, my Lord, for what you are doing here right now, my God. I pray, my Lord, for consistency in our hearts, in our minds, and in our finances, God. I pray right now for breakthrough and overflow as we become more consistent in giving to you, Lord. Because you are the one that provides everything and everything, Lord. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing this morning? Good to be in the house of God. I want to thank all of you for coming out and those who are watching online. Such a beautiful Sunday morning to be in the presence of God. And if this is your first time here, we would just like to welcome you. And we always like to say here, if you're not planted or rooted in a church or don't have a home church, we would pray that you would consider this church to be your home church. Amen. Uh, we, we want to help you to fulfill God's purpose and plan that he has for your life. Well, this morning, before we get into God's word, uh, we do have a, a ceremony that we want to present today. And that is we're going to be having a couple who's going to be renewing their vows. And so it's, uh, amen, yes. So it's exciting when uh, a couple, a married couple wants to renew their vows and uh, before God and and just to, uh, just to remind uh, not just... Uh, the church or God, but to each other, how important they are to each other, how much they mean to each other. And so uh, if you have been married uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever years you've been married, uh, never take your spouse for granted. But always uh, try to rekindle and uh, fan the flame in that marriage. It's important. That's why we every year we have a marriage retreat. And so if, you have, if you're not participating or being a part of this marriage retreat this year, we encourage you to sign up for next year. Uh, it's always a great time just to be refreshed, to get away without kids. It's always good to be without the kids and just to spend some quality, good time and uh, to be imparted of how to enrich your marriage. So today we're going to be having uh, uh, some vows again uh, uh, with uh, Edwin and Angela Morales. And so uh, at this time, if I can have uh, Edwin... Morales, come up. Praise the Lord. He'll be standing right here next to me. At this time, we could all stand, amen. beautiful song, man. I, can't, I actually love this song, amen. So a, I was like, just keep it going, keep it going. Such a romantic, loving song. If you, if Edwin and Morales and Angela Morales, if you could just stand and hold hands, one hand and face me. You may all be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Today we are all honored uh, to share this special occasion with all of you as Angela and Edwin had, uh, had brought this attention to my attention to want to renew the vows with family and friends who are here today. And uh, it is a special day, and, and I know that they are, just by watching their faces and the tears in their face of their love towards one another, and I, I, know, I know that it brings remembrance of the day that they first uh, ex uh, not only accepted Christ, but also, you know, Gave, each, um, gave themselves to each other in marriage. But we believe that entering into a marriage is not the final step in a relationship. Amen? But it's really the beginning of a grand adventure that we believe will last and be fruitful. Eddie and Angela have shared their joys, their blessings, and challenges of, of, of married life, and again, in just a short period of time of three years. But today, they wish to reconfirm their commitment to working together to become better together as, as one. And to, for their marriage to grow and blossom for the many years to come. And we pray that this ceremony of renewing the vows that today they are taking as husband and wife, uh, take them back three years ago when they stood before 
an altar like this or maybe at an outside setting, that they would remember that every day in life they are to love and to respect and trust and understand each other so that their marriage will continue to increase and grow within each other. Again, Eddie, I want to ask you this today, and that is, will you continue to honor Angela as your wife and continue to live in this marriage? I want you to look at each other. <laughs> Eddie, do you reaffirm your love for her with, with will you love and honor and cherish her in sickness and in health for richer or poorer, for better or for worse, and forsaking all others, being faithful to her as long as you both shall live. Angela, will you continue to honor Eddie as your husband and to continue to live in this marriage? Do you reaffirm your love for him? Will you love and honor and cherish him in sickness and in health for richer or poor, for better or for worse, forsaking all others, being faithful to him? as long as you both shall live. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7 says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Three years ago, Eddie and Angela, on your wedding day, you exchanged rings as a symbol of never-ending circle of love. The rings that you wear today serve as a reminder of your wedding vows to each other and your commitment to live in unity, love, and happiness. At this time, if I can have the ring. Angela, as you place the ring in Eddie's finger, I want you to repeat after me. I, Angela, take you, Eddie, to be my lawfully wedded husband, my closest friend, my best friend, my faithful partner in life, and my one true love. On this day, I give to you my sacred promise to stay by your side as your faithful wife in sickness and in health, in joy and in sorrow, through the good times and the bad. I promise to love you without reservation, comfort you, in times of distress, to laugh with you and even cry with you, always be open with you and honest and cherish you for as long as we both shall live. Eddie, as you place the finger, the, the ring on Angela's finger, I want you to repeat after me. I, Eddie, take you, Angela, to be my lawfully wedded wife my closest friend, my best friend, my faithful partner in life, and my one true love. On this special day, I give to you my sacred promise to stay by your side as your faithful husband in sickness and in health, in joy and in sorrow, through the good times and the bad. I promise to love you without reservation, honor and respect you, and provide for you the needs that I best can to comfort you in times of distress and cherish you for as long as we both shall live. Eddie and Angela, I ask that you each remember to continue to cherish each other as a special and unique individuals that you each respect the thoughts and ideas of one another. 
And most of all, to be able to forgive each other and not hold grudges against one another. Live each day in love with each other, always being there to give love, comfort, and refuge to each other in good times and bad. Eddie and Angela, today you have renewed the promises and the vows you made to each other three years ago on your wedding day. You have symbolized the renewal of the marriage union by the joining of hands, taking the vows, and, be, and, and by wearing of your wedding rings. At this time, if we could all stretch our right hand, we would love to pray for Eddie and Angela so that their marriage would continue to be covered by God and also covered by your prayers as you pray for them and as you encourage them and support them in time of good times and bad. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for Eddie and Angela. And Father, we pray that as they continue, God, to grow in their marriage, that, Father, that you would be the center, that you would cover them, that they would love each other, respect each other, and forgive each other at all times, Lord. I pray that they would, their marriage would be enriched. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen them and give them wisdom and growing and how to support each other, and, Lord, how to just work together as becoming better one, Lord. We thank you for what you have done today on this special occasion, and I pray, Father, that they will always remember back from the day that they first loved you, Lord. We thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. It is with great pleasure, amen, that I conclude this ceremony with renewing of the vows of your marriage that joining you and binds you as husband and wife. Eddie, you may once again kiss your bride. Once again, I would like to announce for the second time as they renounce their vows, Eddie and Angela Morales. You didn't have to shut it that fast. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's always a blessing to celebrate, and it's an honor as well to, to be able to be a part of a ceremony, whether it's a wedding or renewing vows. It's always just a praise of honoring God of what God is doing in people's lives today. And so it's not something that we should uh, take for granted, but it's something that we should value at all times, the, the people that God puts in our path. And so today, it's, again, we, we come to the house of God to give reverence and honor because God is good. And not only is God good, but God is faithful. And he has been faithful to us. He has been faithful in our journey of, walking with him as we fight the good fight of faith. And I want to minister today on a message that I have entitled, God is Faithful. And we can always reflect of all the things that God has done in our life. We've gone through some tough times. We've gone through some rough times. We've gone through some ups and downs. But in the midst of everything that we face in life, God is still faithful. God is always there. And every time we are in a tough position, we could always pray a prayer. And oftentimes we do pray a prayer of, God, get me out of this situation. God, help me to not fall apart. Help me to, to uh, get through this pain and agony that I'm going through at this particular time. And it, it always seems that God always comes to our rescue at the right time when we are desperate for a touch or something for God to do in the midst of our situation. So I believe that God is faithful at all times. Even at times when we feel he's not faithful, God is faithful. 
And even at times where we are not faithful, can I tell you that God is still faithful? So I want to take you to the book of Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 today. If you could turn there with me, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I want to read to you a particular scripture here that I believe that we should reflect on on a daily basis when we feel that God is not faithful or we feel like God's not there. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, if you're there, say amen. Amen. The Bible reads this. It says, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within me, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Amen? I want to read that one more time so that we really just let that word marinate in our spirit today. And it says this, that, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Father, for you are faithful. You are faithful, God. And I pray that that word continues to come out of our lips, that you are faithful. Even when we hear other voices tells us that you're not. But we know that you are faithful, God, because you were not forsaking your children. And, Lord, we are here today to honor you, to love you, to be at, of your service. And we ask you today that you would continue to, re- to remove every distraction that may try to cause us not to hear your word or to hear that you are faithful. But I pray that we would receive your word with open arms and understand that, God, that we are here today to honor you, Father. So we thank you today. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to read to you uh, the amplified version of this scripture as well. And it says it this way. It says that I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of of his return. How many know that Jesus will return one day? He will come back for his sons. He will come back for those who have accepted him and have received them into their life. And he is your Lord and Savior. Jesus will come back. We live in a world that is constantly falling apart. We're living in a world where you, 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 you really can't even go anywhere or look with there being some kind of wickedness taking place. But yet the scripture says that I am convinced and confident. And this is where God wants us to be at a place where we are convinced and we are confident of this very thing. What is he talking about here? Well, the scripture says that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. So he's talking about here is the work that he's doing in you today. When you, again, when you accepted Christ, God, you are a work in progress. God is trying to root out but also develop. One of the things is the fruits of the Spirit. But he's also trying to develop good character, righteousness, all these fruits in your life. Why? Because he wants us to be what? The salt on the earth. He wants us to be the light that shines upon darkness. And so we, but we have to be convinced and confident. Why is he saying convinced and confident? Because there are times where you will not feel convinced and confident. We all know of an enemy that wants to to discourage us or to lie to us and to deceive us that God is not faithful. That God does not have a purpose for your life. That because of all your struggles and all of your past sins and present sins, that God cannot use your life or that you will not ever amount to anything. That will even tell you what's the purpose on going to church. Why go to church if you keep struggling? Why go to church if you're still struggling in your 
in your family, in your marriage, in your finances, in your health? Why even consider going to church and doing something for God where everything else continues to fall apart? But yet the scripture, if you put it back on, he is saying, I am convinced. I am convinced that regardless of what the enemy says or no matter what anyone says about me, I'm convinced and confident of this very thing. So, in other words, we have to approach life in the sense of I could care less what anyone else thinks of me because what really matters is what God thinks of me. So you can say whatever you want. You can try to label me whatever you want. You can, you know, use whatever you want of my past. But again, I'm convinced and confident because the day that I accepted Christ, God, I am a work in progress. And we have to come to this place of knowing that God is faithful and confident that the work that he has started in you, God will finish it. Regardless of the setbacks, regardless of the time, the, when you, if you stumble, God will finish what he has started. Now, one other version says it this way. It says, God is the one who begun this good work in you. And I am certain that he won't stop before it is complete on the day that Christ Jesus returns. So automatically, he says, God is the one. Now, we know that he's the one that is with us in this journey. Right? And he says, he, who has begun this good work in you, I am certain that he won't stop. God doesn't stop, we stop. Let me say that one more time. God doesn't quit on you. God doesn't give up on you. We stop pursuing God in this journey. We stop serving God. We stop believing that God can actually use us because of the things that we're doing or the things that we're hearing. But he says that he won't stop before it is complete on the day that Christ Jesus returns. So God is constantly trying to remind you and myself that we are a work in progress and he is faithful to complete whatever he has started in this journey that you are in with him. Amen? God's word never comes back void. God's word, the living word, the word, the word that came down from heaven and was breathed through Christ Jesus, his word never goes void. Never goes void. So what I mean by that is this. The moment you speak God's word, not me, but again, for my personal life, I speak God's word. But again, you have to understand to speak God's word for yourself. So when you speak God's word, listen to me, this is what happens. His word is released to fulfill its assignment. Its assignment, its purpose on earth. So meaning, if you speak into your marriage good things, its assignment and its purpose will be fulfilled. But if all you do is speak death into your marriage, you're cursing your marriage. So if you're speaking negative and you're saying, well, she or he is not doing this and they're lazy and this and that, well, then how do you expect God to bless it? Because the, the Bible, the Word of God also says that there's power in the tongue. There's power in the tongue. So what are you speaking? What are you speaking into your children? What are you speaking to yourself? If you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling like throwing your life away, if you feel like you're just no good and you have nothing to offer, what are you speaking into yourself and what are you allowing others to speak into you? Because again, if you were to speak the word of God into your life and speak, your, speak the word of God into your loved ones, then again, the word has the power to break chains, to break curses. So don't say, well, mom was this way, so I'm this way. So don't accept the past. Don't accept what has happened in the past, but rather change it by speaking the word of God, by releasing the word of God 
so that it can fulfill its assignment and its purpose. You got to you got to get you got to get the word inside of you in order to speak it. Because you have to believe it before you can speak it. If you don't believe it, how can you speak it into existence? So again, God's word always accomplishes what it's assigned to do. It will always it may not be on your time. It may not be in a week, it may not be in a month, it may not even be in a year. But at some point, the Word of God always accomplishes what it has been assigned to do. Not only does His Word accomplish what it's assigned to do, but He will always do it on His time. His time. Now, I know that we are a people that are very patient. We're all very patient people here. It's just the people that are driving that are very impatient. We never give dirty looks. We never tell people that they're number one. But we're the type of people that just like, love to smile at people and just say, hey, praise the Lord, have a blessed day, and go out about our business. No, God is faithful. And yet, our faith is constantly being tested. Maybe this morning before you came to church, your faith was being tested. I know my faith was being tested last night during at the beach. When the beach is crowded and there's nowhere to park, and you have to walk a good distance, you just have to learn to put a smile on your face and say, God, you're faithful, you're good. But no matter what you're going through, what circumstance you are in today, or what even you're feeling right now, hear me out, your feelings shouldn't determine your destiny. Because oftentimes we base our life or our decisions based on what we feel. And we can all agree that at some point we have made some bad decisions, bad choices, because we went off of what we feel what we feel. It seems like every second you feel something different. And that's a scary place to live your life. It's to constantly basing everything you do off of what you feel. But you would think that at some point that if we're constantly going off of what we feel and it's not working, that we would change it. But, uh, but sometimes that's not the case. But again, if you're taking notes, I encourage you to do so this morning. But again, your feelings shouldn't determine your destiny. It's your faith in God that determines your destiny. Amen. Your faith in God. Who is your God this morning? Who do you serve this morning? Because if you serve God, you will be convinced in what his word says. You will stand on his word regardless of how your situation looks and regardless of how you feel in the moment. It's the word of God. It's our faith. It's our faith that pleases God, not our feelings. It's our faith. God wants to see where your faith is at today. But it doesn't just stop on a Sunday morning. It continues Monday through Friday. Because every day we face obstacles. Every day we face situations. Every day we got to deal with people. And not every person that you deal with is saved, is serving God. But sometimes we deal with, again, we assume that our devils and demons at work or, you know, in the streets, we, we, we assume that these are the people that we're constantly dealing with. And that's why we make rational decisions that are not godly. But the Bible says that I shouldn't be moved by what I feel or see, but I should be convinced and confident in what the Word says. We should always go back to what the Word says. What does the Word of God say? Even though I feel this way, I need to always go back to what the Word says. I feel this way today, but I need to go back to the Word. 
because I want to make sure that if this is how I feel, that it lines up with what the Word of God says. No matter what I think, I should always go back to make sure that it lines up with the Word of God. Every decision that you make needs to line up with the Word of God. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, don't make a decision. Can I tell you why you shouldn't make a decision? Because that problem will still be there tomorrow. And tomorrow you'll have another opportunity to make a better decision, to make a wise decision. Better yet, to make a godly decision. There's a difference between a decision and a godly decision. A decision that you go based off what you feel and what you see and what your heart tells you can cause some damage. But it's, it's playing, it's playing like you're playing a, the roulette. You're taking a chance. But when you base, make a decision based off God's word, it's 100% that God's word never fails. His word is faithful to complete, again, what it has been assigned to do. So, again, I am certain that what God has started, he will complete it. In other words, he will finish it. So he saved you for a purpose. He put you in ministry for a purpose. He gave you a spouse for a purpose. He gave you children for a purpose. He gave you that job for a purpose. Everything that we have on earth is for a purpose. We just have to figure out what his purpose is for us to do in what we have and what he has entrusted us with. So if he's giving you that job, there's a reason why he gave you that job. Could it be that there's someone in that job that may be thinking about committing suicide and God wants to use you to speak life into them so that they don't throw their life away? Could it be that God gave you that spouse so that you wouldn't be a knucklehead? To teach you, to teach you how to love, to teach you how to be more respectful, to teach you manners. Now the men are saying, say something about the women now, Pastor. Come on. (laughs) Don't leave the men hanging here. Women. God gave you a man. You said to me, he gave you a man so, so that he could also humble you. And I'm just going to stop it at that because that's more than enough. That's more than enough. But he gave you a husband to keep you humble. And if you can learn to humble yourself, then God will elevate you. Not only that, but if you're wanting your husband to love you in such a way that he treats you like a queen, which you should regardless, but if you're looking for him to treat you as a queen, then maybe you need to learn to humble yourself and be respectful of the man that he's placed in your life. I'll stop it at that so that we're even with each, each party. So listen to me this morning. No matter what your circumstance may look like right now, today, let me just remind you of this. And you may want to write this down. You ready? Your best days are not behind you. Your best days are not behind you. We're always reminiscing about the past victories. We're reminiscing about the good old days of things that brought us pleasure or the things that we achieved, the material things that we've achieved. But let me remind you that the best days are not behind you. As long as as you surrender to God, and as long as God is the center of your life and you are committed and faithful to him, Your greatest days are ahead of you. 
So all those things that you continue to reminisce, God is saying, listen, I got more yes. victories and more blessings in store for you that are ahead that you'll be able to talk about for years and years. Your greatest days are not behind you, church. Your greatest days are still ahead of you. God, God still has things that he wants, to, he wants to fulfill and accomplish in your life. There's a lot of stuff. We limit God of what God wants to do in us. But we have to learn again to give to full reverence and, and, and surrenders to God so that God can reveal more to us. And so we need to be open to receive what God wants to do. So let me read that scripture once again, which we read in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He says, I am convinced and confident. Say that this morning. I am convinced and confident. Say it again. I am convinced and I am confident. You have to remember that this morning. I am convinced. You are convinced. Are you convinced that, when so, that if someone looks in your eyes, that they see the confidence they see the confidence in who you serve, that you're not going to waver left or right, that you're not going to make any rational decisions, that you're not going to base your decisions on what you feel and what you think and what your heart tells you, but again, you are confident and the people that your family that are a part of your life and those that are under your roof, they're confident that the decisions that you make on earth are godly decisions. I am confident and convinced, confident and convinced of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue. He uses the word continue because it's ongoing. It's not just a Sunday or Wednesday thing, but it's an ongoing thing. It's not just a weekly thing or a monthly thing or even just a year thing. It's, it, it's until he returns. We don't quit. We don't stop. Because God never stops. God never quits. So until we hear the trump of the sound, the sound of the trumpet, we should keep going forward. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Keep fighting for what God has entrusted you with. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that it's just a breeze. It's work. Yeah. It's work. Yeah. Marriage is work. Yeah. Raising up kids is a work. It's work. Yeah. Everything we do, it's work. You have to work. You have to press in. You have to fight. Yeah. No one said it was easy. Even, even, before you get, even before you serve God, life, you had to work. Yeah. So you have to understand that until we hear the Trump of the sound, until Jesus comes back to take his bride home, he's not going to stop paying attention to you or your circumstance. God's not going to stop. He's always lining things up. He's working everything for your good. You're good. That's what makes serving God so amazing. We haven't even started to reach our full potential, church, to what God has for us. We haven't even scratched the surface yet. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Think about that. We can't even fathom how good God is and what he wants to do in us as individuals on this earth. We will never comprehend what God is doing to the fullest. But the more we spend time with him, the more he reveals to us. The more we worship him, the more we get into his word, the more fellowship we have with him and with other believers, the more God manifests his presence, but also gives us revelation of his word and understanding of it so that we can grow and proceed into what God has called us to do. Another version of that, 1 Corinthians 2.9, which is the CEB, CEB version, says, what God has planned for people who love him is more than eyes have seen or ears have heard. It has never, ever entered our minds. We sometimes tend to look with a sense of anticipation the day that, we'll, that we will go to heaven to be with Jesus. 
But I also to believe to some degree that we don't look with enough anticipation to the things that God has prepared for those who love him right now. We're thinking about when he's returning, but we're not looking at what God wants to do right now on this earth. Again, I said there's a lot of wickedness on this earth. That means that God wants to use us to be the light upon this wicked world, to use us to bring as many souls into the kingdom so that we can populate earth. How do we do that? Well, one way of doing that is we have to be convinced and confident that he is able to use us to be able to minister and reach the lost so that they can be set free, they can be transformed, they can have a renewed mind, they can have a, a new life, and begin to serve God to the fullest. God wants each and every single one of us to have an abundant life. Because the moment you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you became a child of God. Meaning that you became, again, a work in progress. Meaning that he is the potter and you are the clay. So every day he is pushing buttons and he is molding your life in areas that hurt, areas that are not comfortable. And he is molding the area of your character because your character has been one way for such a long, for, for a good period of time where you, you struggle with anger, you struggle with uh, bitterness, you struggle with unforgiveness, you struggle with jealousy. All of these things God is molding and it doesn't feel good when he's pressing those buttons and God is trying to make you to acknowledge that you have a problem or an addiction or a habit in this area and he's trying to strip it and we don't like it. But God is saying that if you want me to change and you want me to give you that abundant life, you have to learn to allow me to stretch you so that I can put something new in you. We say we want joy, but how can we have joy if we still struggle with anger and bitterness. Has anybody ever told you, you have anger issues? And our first reaction response is, no, I don't. But you say it with so, so much rage. We have to realize that after five to ten people that tell you you have an anger problem, maybe you should really figure it out. It doesn't take a prophet to tell you after that or anyone else to tell you that you have to accept that you have an anger problem. And so at that point, we have to be able to, the Bible says that we are to cast our burdens unto him. That's why it's important that we lay our burdens at his feet. He says, give me all your weight meaning your anxiety, your depression, your, your struggles. He says, I want all that and just leave it at the altar. All that stuff you carry is not meant for you to carry. God didn't create you to carry the weight of sin. That's why he died on the cross, so that you wouldn't have to, so that you would have an abundant life. So if you want to get rid of this anger, this jealousy, this bitterness, this, this rage inside of you, give it to God. Release it to God. That's the only way you're going to over, ever overcome it is by doing that very, that very thing. Because, again, he's trying to mold you. Every single day we need to wake up and say, Lord, mold me into who you want me to be. Use me however you want to use me. Tell the person next to you, I'm a work in progress. You and I are a work in progress. We're not perfected. We don't have the perfect home, the perfect life. But we're a work in progress. And we have to learn to accept that God is trying to mold new things into our life to better us. And when God betters you, he betters those around you. 
That's what he does. But when you're angry, you make others around you angry. When you're bitter, you make others around you bitter. When you're frustrated, you make everybody else around you frustrated. I want you to realize that no matter what the devil says or throws at you, Jesus already has the victory. Jesus has already the victory. He's just waiting on to see how you respond. Because he already knows in advance of every attack that the enemy throws at you. And so he already has the answer. Now he wants to see how you respond. How do you respond in the midst of, in the midst of a circumstance, a situation? Because there is nothing that the devil can do to stop God's purpose and plan from being fulfilled in your life. Amen. As the worship team comes up, I'm going to stop right there. And I'll continue this next week. But God is faithful. Tell the, per- tell the person next to you, God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. The reason why I, say, I tell you to say that is because I want you to be convinced and confident that he is faithful. But you also, as I mentioned in the beginning of my message, is that you have to speak. Speak those words. Because your words have power. And when you speak God's word, his word is released to accomplish and fulfill its purpose. So if you believe and if you are convinced and believe that he is faithful, his word will fulfill its purpose. God is faithful. His word never goes void. It brings life. And so this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed in reverence to God. Today you're here, you're visiting. to tell you that it is not accident that you are here today. It's not an accident. But everything that God does, everywhere God takes you, there's a purpose for it. There's a purpose why you are here today. And I believe that God wants to remind you today that He loves you created you for a purpose. Our purpose here on earth is to honor Him, to worship Him, and to lead others to Him. But maybe today you're not saved. And to sum it up of what being saved is, saved means that you have to accept and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died on the cross and he resurrected on the third day. But you confess that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Maybe today you're backslidden in your heart or at one point you were serving God. He was the center of your life. But somewhere, at some point, you lost focus, and God no longer became the center or became a priority to you. But you put other things before Him. And as you put those other things before Him, you stop going to church, you stop reading your Bible, you stop having fellowship with God and other believers but I'm here to remind you that God has not forgotten about you God is not angry with you but there is a purpose why you're here today and God knew that this would be the day that you would be here today that tells me that God is faithful he is faithful and he loves you and all he's asking is for you to come back home and re 
realign your life back again to where God is the center of your life. So this morning, if you're here, you're not saved or you're vaccinated and you want to accept him or rededicate your life to him, if that's you, I want you to just raise your hand. If, you're, if you can be honest and say, you know what, I need God in my life. Or I need to recommit my life to God because my life is not where it should be. My life is falling apart. And I want to encourage you this morning that if you allow God in your life, God is faithful to line everything back up and get you back on track. So if there's anyone here that would be honest and say, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to rededicate my life back to God. Would you raise your hand? If there's anyone here that would be honest and say, that's me. I'm in need of a Savior. I'm in need of Jesus in my life. I don't want to keep going in this direction. I see that hand there. Is there anyone else? That would be honest. If you're not 100% sure that if you were to die today that you would make it to heaven, don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait till that last second because we are all going to stand before God one day. And he's going to ask you, what did you do with my son Jesus? What what are you going to do with that opportunity that was given to you to accept me into your life? Because it's not about just knowing of his name but it's about having a personal relationship with him. So if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, or you're vaccinated and you want to to recommit your life to God, this is the time to do it. Because you're not promised tomorrow. The moment you walk out these doors, you're not promised at the end of the day. But if you want to make sure that if anything was to happen to you today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, whenever, you're 100% sure that if something did happen that you would make it to heaven this is a time to give your life to Jesus to say this prayer of salvation is there anyone here anyone else that would say that's me I want to I want to accept Christ I want to recommit my life anyone else before I change the order of the service Praise God. If you raised your hand this morning, or maybe you did it and you want to accept Christ, I want to encourage you to come to this altar.